Oh, we've got some people online. Okay. And this is okay for this. Yeah, let's move this away. And we're good there. Okay. Um, I just upload. First of all, wake up. That, that's just as much. That's just as much for me as for you. So it's getting late. It's getting dark out. You know, it gets dark out earlier, so it's kind of hard to adjust. Uh, I uploaded a new document to Blackboard uh, called Session Eight dot docx word document. Kind of a uh, accumulation of the other three documents. Kind of I picked and chose some specific examples that we can work with. I'm going to open that, and when it opens up, I'm going to start working on it. Before we do that, I just want to introduce the whole idea. Okay, we do have a few people online. If you guys online, if you can hear me and see my screen, just type in hello. So I know that you guys were communicating with you guys. Ah, great, terrific. Okay, before we get into the problems, I just want to go, go over real quickly uh, a little bit of what we're doing here. We know that if we know, let's say we know the mean of a population and we know the standard deviation for that population. We know that for any sample size, n, different n, different n, we know for any particular sample size, we know how by chance that that samples, repeated samples of that size are going to distribute themselves. So in other words, we know that, that if this is the mean, and this is the standard deviation, we know for this sample size, this particular sample size, the distribution of sample means for that sample size are going to follow a, a, distribu a, 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 a distribution of their own, where the standard deviation for those repeated samples what we call the standard error, is equal to sigma over the square root of n. Okay, We know that that's the way they're going to distribute themselves. We know that if we take, let's say n is 100, we know that half the time, when we take a sample of size 100, half the time the mean is going to be less than 100, less than, mu, less than mu, half the time it's going to be more than mu, whatever mu happens to be. right? 
we know that very rarely that the that the mean when we take a sample of size 100 we know that very rarely we're going to get means for our sample of 100 that are very far from the true population mean and and this distribution is normal distribution with this with the standard deviation standard hours equal to the square root of n describes what the probability is of getting all those various sample uh, sample means okay so we know that for instance that 95% of the time if we take a sample of size 100 from this population that it's going to be between two standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviations above the mean in real life we know it's really 1.96 right if we really carefully go and look at the uh, z table but 95% of the time if we take a sample of, of for instance size 100 or any size for that matter cuz the, the the sample size is going to make the standard error change 95% of the time that our sample will will fall our sample mean will fall between two standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviations above the mean that means also that 5% of the time it's not going to fall within that range sometimes we're going to get an extreme value that's more than two standard deviations below or more than two standard deviations above. That's going to happen 5% of the time, right? Just by chance. So if I look at this 5% of the time, well, well, since this is symmetrical, I know that represents 2.5% on this end and 2.5% on this end. Now, if I were to go out and I were to take a random sample from another population, not from this specific population, but from another population. And if I were to take a sample size of 100 from that population, and I were to then calculate the mean from that population, right? The mean, let's say the mean, it's gonna, I'm going to call it X bar because it's a sample, right? Um, I, I would calculate the mean, and that mean came out to, I'm going to throw some numbers in here now so we can play with this a little bit. I'm going to call the mean 50, I'm going to call the standard deviation. Uh, uh, let, me, let me change that a little bit. Call that 500 and the standard deviation. Uh, let me pick a nice number. Standard deviation. I'm going to call standard deviation 50. Okay. And uh, actually, yeah, let's call standard deviation 100. Okay. Mean is 500. Standard deviation is 100. Well, if I take repeated samples of size 100 from, from this population, then 95% of the time, I'm going to be between, well, let's see, it's going to be 100, the standard deviation over the square root of the sample size is 100, which is 10. It's going to be within 20 of 500, 95% of the time. So 95% of the time, my mean is going to be between 480 and 520. Even if I take a sample from this population, 5% of the time, it's going to be either higher or lower than 480 and 520. So now I go to a whole new population. Let's say that I get a, a, uh, a mean for a sample size of 100. I get a mean which is 500. Well, what does that tell me? Well, gee, it looks like it's the same thing, right? Mean of the sample of 100 that I took from population B is the same of the mean of that, that I know that that population is, right? Pretty lucky, right? Well, let's say instead of 500, I get 490. How likely is it that I would have another population with a different mean and we would get a outcome of 490? How likely it is, is it that I would get an outcome, say, 490, or say even lower than 490? Well, that's, that's only one standard error below the mean in this population. So I would get 490 or lower 16% of the time, I'm not going to bother to like go through the whole math, that whole thing again, the geometry of the whole thing again. 16% of the time, I might get a value in my population that is that low or lower. Or if I looked at, say, 10 above, 510, well, another 16% of the time, right? So 32% of the time, I might get a value from the population that we know 
that is more than 10, 10, 10 below the, uh, 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 the, mean, the true population mean, or more than 10 above the true population. One standard deviation, one standard deviation above. So this isn't a very unlikely outcome. But now let's say I get, uh, uh, I get 470 instead of 490. Well, gee, that's all the way down here. That's three standard deviations away from the true population mean. How likely is it that this sample came from this population or a population with the same mean and standard deviation? It's not very likely, right? It'd be a rare event. So we have to say to ourselves, well, how, how far away, how unlikely does it have to be that these two that this sample came from this po population, how unlikely does that have to be for me to say that the mean of this population is not equal to the mean of the other population, the one that this sample came from? How unlikely does that have to be? Well, we could set our own rule for that, right? We could say one standard deviation is enough. In other words, it only has to be less than 32% chance. Or we could say two standard deviations, it only has to be 5% chance, you know, two and a half on each side. Or we can say it could be 99.7%, which is three standard deviation. Most of the time, we're going to be satisfied with 5% chance. In other words, a 5% chance that we're, if we have less than a 5% chance that our sample mean, our sample, the mean for our sample could have been produced by the same population we're willing to say that the two means two population means are equal, right? We call that an alpha. We call that the alpha error, the level of error that we're willing to accept that we will say that the two means of these two populations are different, without uh, 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 that the two means of these two populations are different. We're willing to accept five percent or or one percent chance of being wrong. In other words having a situation where we actually wind up with the two means being the same. Okay, That's the same way we calculate the confidence interval, right? We figured a 95% confidence interval. So we're saying we want to, we're only going to be willing to reject the idea that the two means are the same if they're outside of the confidence interval, if the second mean is outside of the confidence interval for the population mean. Okay, so now that's kind of a rare event that we know the actual population uh, mean and standard deviation. Most of the time, not tonight, but most of the time, we're going to be comparing two populations, population one to population two, and we're going to have samples from each of those two populations. Ah, keep forgetting to turn this thing off. Nobody ever calls, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's what do you call it? Spam too. Okay. So, so most of the time, we're going to be working with two samples instead of one because it's a rare event that we know uh, the, the population of any mean, you know, uh, unless we have a census and we select, we, we test everybody. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at an example of this. Okay, so let's say we have, uh, we know, for instance, they, they sampled every student uh, at Hunter and um, they found that the uh, uh, first year students at Hunter, the average SAT score is uh, 620, I guess, whatever, humanities or something like that. Um, the standard deviations for the score in that, that population is 95. Uh, an investigator believes we went over this for confidence. Uh, we, we applied this to confidence interval. Now we're going to look at it from the perspective of a hypothesis test. Um, uh, uh, an investigator believes that the mean SAT score of first year psych majors is significantly different than the mean for the score of the entire population. Uh, the mean of a sample of 36 randomly selected first year psychology majors is 648. So let's first of all, let's see what we know here. Uh, the first thing that we know is, is that uh, the mean for Hunter students Okay, is equal to 620, all Hunter students, that is. Okay, and we know that the standard deviation sigma for those students is 95. Okay, now we're going to take a sample of a different group of students, psych majors, right? And we're going to say that the mean for psych majors 
is equal to, well, I, we don't actually know the mean for snipe mages, right? We know the sample uh, mean, which is we're going to call X bar, right? So the, the mean for the, our sample of psych majors, oh, whoops, I got the wrong one. The mean X bar for our psych majors is equal to 648. Okay, we know this, we, we chose a sample size of 36, right? We got to pick the sample size, 36. And uh, uh, we're going to say to ourselves, okay, I'm going to assume for the moment that the uh, standard deviation is roughly, the, the variability is roughly the same as the pop population. So I'm going to assume that I know what the standard deviation is. Okay, so now I want to decide whether psych students, the real population mean for psych students is different from the population mean for the rest of the population. Okay, so we're going to state a null and an alternative hypothesis for what we're interested in proving here. Well, first thing is we always start off with an equality. We always start off with the assumption that the two groups have the same mean, and it's incumbent on us to produce evidence that says that we can reject that idea and demonstrate that they don't have the same mean. And also kind of quantify what the likelihood is that we would be wrong if we did that. Okay, so let's see. So we're going to say the mean for Hunter students Hunter students is equal to the mean for psych majors, Hunter psych majors. Okay, that's an equality, right? Notice I use mu for both of those. Because in our hypothesis, we're not interested in proving that, that, that the means of samples are different because we see what the sample means are. We can see that they're the same or different. But we're interested in the entire population. So our null hypothesis, I'm going to call that H null, right? In other words, no difference or uh, uh, the same is that the two means are equal. And our alternative hypothesis is that the two means, Hunter students, are not equal to one another. Okay, good. So what level of confidence do we want to have that we get the right answer? Okay, what do you guys think? We want to be 95% certain, right? Okay, so we want to be 95% certain. So that means that what level of error are we willing to accept? Right, 5%. So our alpha error is going to be equal to 5%. Okay, good. So I think we're set up now. We have our null hypothesis. Now let's test our null hypothesis. Okay, so first of all, what are we really looking for here? Oops, let me undo that. What are we really trying to demonstrate? We're trying to determine whether or not it's likely that we could get a result like this from this population. What's the likelihood that this result would fit into this population? How often, what percentage of the time, would we get this kind of result, 648, as the mean for a sample size of 36, from this population? How far away from the mean for this population do we think that the mean uh, is, this light, is this outcome in terms of like the sample? Okay, so in order to do that, we have to calculate how many standard deviations or standard errors, because we're dealing with a sample, apart are these two means, is 648 from 620. So the, let's see, how would I calculate that? Well, first of all, do I, am I interested in Z scores or T scores? Which one do you think I'm going to use for this problem? Z scores. Okay, let's use a Z score since we are assuming that we know what the, that both of these have the same uh, standard deviation, both uh, so z score is going to be equal to it's going to be equal to the difference between the two means, right? X bar minus mu for uh, all students, X bar for psych students, and uh, mu for all students over the standard error. What's the standard error equal to? It's equal to sigma divided by the square root. Whoops, square root of the sample size. Okay, so okay, so first thing I got to do, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this in a couple of steps. First, I'm gonna calculate uh, 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 this the standard error, right? Let's take that is equal to 95 divided by the square root of what did I say? Sample size 36. Okay, which is equal to 
95 divided by 6, which is equal to, what is that? That's 15, 15 point, what was that? 0 0.833, 0 0.8333, is that it? Okay, 15.83, okay, we'll use that. Okay, so now, how many standard errors apart are these two values? Well, now, now we're going to calculate our z-score. A z-score is going to be equal to um, 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 6, 6, we'll see, uh, x bar is 648 minus 620 over uh, 15.83. Okay, so that's 28 over 15.83. What is that equal to? 28 divided by 15.83 is equal to, somebody got a calculator out there? I, what was that? 1.76 is equal to 1.76. Okay, so let's go back to a look at our, and look, get, go back and take a look at this. Okay. So if we took repeated samples of size 36 from our population of Hunter students, we know the mean would come up to be 620. That's the mean for the population. And the standard error is going to be equal to 15.83. Right? So that means that 95% of the time, that we would expect, I'm going to call that 16 for a moment. Okay, 95% of the time, we would expect our sample, if we took a sample of size 36, we would expect the mean to be, say, 1632, to be about between about 580 and 88 to 650, 52, roughly, right? Somewhere between those two, 95% of the time. Well, in this case, what did our mean come out to be? Our mean came out to be 620, uh, excuse me, 648. And 648 was not two standard deviations away, right? It was only 1.7, what did we say, 1.73? I'm sorry? 1.76 standard deviations away. So the probability that we would get uh, uh, the percentage of the time would be that we would get a mean for a sample size of 36 that's above 1.76 standard errors away and or below negative 1.76. Remember that there, this was not directional, right? When we made up our, our null and alternative hypothesis, we were, we were willing to accept at either extreme, further away on the negative side, further away on the positive side. Okay, so... These two areas, what do they add up to? Well, what does this area add up to? Okay, well, I can go my Z table, right? Let's see. Let me find my Z table. Uh, I think I got it there somewhere, but I'll, it's just easy to do this. Okay, here's my Z table. Okay, 1.76, 1.70. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, 96.08.9608. So this area, whoops, don't need that. This area to the left is 9608.9608. So that leaves 0 0.392. Am I right? I think I'm right, right? 0.392 by 0.392, 3.92%, say roughly 4%. So we have 4% chance that from this population or a population with the same mean and variability as the Hunter students, that there's a 4% chance we would get a value that extreme or even higher for the mean. Well, since this is symmetrical, we got a 4% chance we would also get a value that extreme or lower below the mean, right? So there's an 8% chance that we could get this even when, uh, even when the, uh, if we could get this 
and still be part of this population, that extreme of value or smaller or larger, and still be part of that population. Well, that means that if we, reach, if we try to say that the mean for all the students does not equal the mean for just the psych majors, well, there's an 8% chance that we would be wrong, that it could be part of the same distribution, right? So what was our tolerance for error? What was alpha equal to? Uh, alpha was equal to 5%, right? We only wanted to tolerate that level of error. How, what level of error do we have in, uh, in this analysis? We have 8%, so it's greater than our, our tolerance for error. We're going to call that the p-value, or the probability that we could get that value or more extreme if the two populations were the same. Okay? Or in other words, the probability we would be wrong if we reject the null hypothesis. Yes. The 0.960. That was the that was the uh, uh, we took the z score 1.76, and we calculated the area to the left of that, but we had to subtract it from. Now, a quick little trick. Instead of doing that, since this is symmetrical, I just could have gone to minus 1.76. 1. minus 1.76 is 0.3 a 0.0392. Right? And then just double that to get the area on the left and the right because it's symmetrical. I could save myself a step by doing that. Okay, so let's go back to this. So let's see what we round up with here. So our p value, our probability of being wrong, is equal to two times, two times 0 0.0392, okay, which is roughly equal to uh, 0.088%. So what's our conclusion here with regard to the null hypothesis? Can we reject the null hypothesis and say the two means are different? No, right? We fail, right? We fail to fail, fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? We can't reject it because there's an eight percent chance that these could that they could be that different the two means and still be same from the same population. Okay. We need a z-score that exceeds 1.96 because we know 1.96 represents 95% certainty. And if it exceeds that, we know there's less than 5% chance that we're, we would get that kind of outcome if the two populations were the same. Okay, so that's what we're after. We're after a p-score that's less than that number. Okay, so uh, I think that I'm going to try another example. So this time, I'm going to step by step, we're going to work through it step by step. But each step I'll pause and you guys write down what you think would be that step, and then we'll take it from there. And then we'll pick that up. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see, is that, okay, let's see. Where did I get that other one? Okay, let's do this. Okay, a uh, fellow student says that the average salary of graduates in your major is $40,000 per year. You don't think this is correct. You think the average salary is, I'm going to change that to different. That word higher is a little bit tricky. It's different than this. To show that your fellow is, a student is wrong, you simply you take a simple random sample of 100 graduates from the past five years and ask for the amount of their starting salary. You find that the sample sample mean is, is, is a couple of typos in here is, let's see, da, 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 100 graduates, is uh, 39,000, is 39,000, and the sample standard deviation is 4,000. Is there evidence to support your claim that the population mean starting salary is different than, uh, than 40,000? I'm going to come back and mention why I changed those words and, and maybe we'll change it back and we'll see what what kind of impact it has. Okay, so let's see what we know here. Okay, first of all, we have a population. The claim is, is that mu is equal to 40,000, that number. Okay, and uh, we know, uh, uh, we don't know this, the, uh, uh, we don't know sigma, right? We just know that the mean is equal to 40,000. Sigma is unknown to us now. Okay, but we did take a sample. And when we took our sample, X bar, the average salary for the sample that we took was $39,000. Okay, 
And the uh, standard deviation for that sample was $4,000. And the sample size was, was 100. Okay, so given that, what level of certainty do we want to, uh, before we reject the null hypothesis? What, what level of uh, error are we willing to accept? What's our alpha going to be? Stick with 5%, right? Okay, so that's going to be our alpha. So we want our p-value, the probability we're going to be wrong if we reject the null hypothesis, the probability that we, we get this extreme a difference in the mean between what we predicted, uh, or what our sample predicts, and what the, popu the other population is, uh, the, uh, the, what the likelihood of being wrong uh, of that occurring to be less than 5%. Okay, so let's see. So let's, I'm going to skip assumptions for now. What is, what's our null hypothesis going to be? You guys write it down. Okay, write yourself whatever you think you, you might want to use. Okay, I'm going to take a I'm going to take a, a whack at this. Okay, so I'm going to say that the mean for the 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 mean that's known, right? The mean the mean I'm going to call that mu zero, right? The predicted mean is equal to forty forty thousand dollars. Okay, and we're going to we're going to speculate that that known mean. Is uh, uh, the mean that we uh, for our sample the mean that of, of the population that our sample is drawn from is equal to the mean that was predicted by that uh, other student, and so I'm going to say the mean that we're that from our population from our sample that that our sample is drawn from is equal to the mean for that population uh, for the uh, population as a whole, and our alternative hypothesis is going to be that they're different. U zero. Okay, another way of stating this, since I have a set value for that uh, reference population, is to say that mu, the one that we're the sample that we're taking, is equal to uh, I'll call that recent grads, is equal to forty thousand, or the mean for recent grads is not equal. 40,000. I'm only substituting the value that we're using for mu, the, the value that we know mu zero is equal to. Okay, so our reference is 40,000. So now let's set up a, uh, let's calculate what our test statistic would be. It's going to be either a t-score, it's going to be a z-score. In this case, is it going to be a t-score or a z-score? T-score, right? Okay, good. Let's calculate what the t value of t is. I'm going to write out the formula, and then you guys can calculate it. T is going to be equal to, now what's it going to be equal to? It's going to be equal to x bar, our sample mean, minus mu zero over the standard error, which is equal to, now I don't have sigma, so in place of sigma, I have to use my standard deviation over the square root of my sample size. Okay, I don't have all my parentheses in, places, in place, but you can go ahead and Calculate that. So what do we calculate? We're calculating, this is the difference between the two means. In one case, it's a sample mean. The other case, it's a population mean. This is a sample between the two means. This is the standard error for my approximation of what this, what this sample distribution of this size is going to look like. So I'm actually calculating the number of standard errors that these two values are apart, or in other words, the number of t-scores that they're apart.
okay, as you continue working on that, I'm going to start to fill in the numbers that I'm going to use. So that's going to be 39,000 minus 40,000 over the standard error. I'm going to calculate standard error separately. It's equal to the standard deviation, which was 4,000, over the square root of the sample size. Sample size was 100, so that's 10, is equal to 400. So my t-score, t, is going to be equal to, oops, it's going to be equal to 1,000, negative 1,000, divided by 400 is equal to negative 2.5. You guys agree with me on that number? You okay with that number? Looks right? Okay. Okay, if this were a z-score, if I had known that the standard deviation of the population, if I could have uh, assumed that the standard deviation of the population was a thousand, is that what it was? That what it, no, four thousand rather. If I could have assumed that, then I would have calculated a Z score. And what I would have done then is I would have gone to the Z table to see what percentage of the time, what pro, what's the probability of getting a Z score that's two and a half, negative two and a half or smaller to get that light, like that, uh, 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 distant a z-score, that extreme a z-score, or or more distant. Well, that's going to be negative two and a half. It's going to be two point five, negative two point five zero. That's going to be about six tenths of one percent, point zero zero six, right? So that means that one side of the distribution is six tenths of one percent. The likelihood of getting a a, a uh, similarly getting a value that's that's it, that extreme on the high side, remember I, I would accept either side, is going to be six tenths of one percent. I add them together, so my overall p score would have been p is equal to our overall p score would have been uh, zero one two, right? Point oh six double, point zero zero six double, point zero one two. Is point zero one two smaller than my alpha error? Alpha point oh five. It is. So it's less than, it's, there's less than 5% chance I would be wrong if I said these two populations were different, right? So what would I do in that case? I'd reject my null hypothesis, right? P is less than alpha, so I reject my null hypothesis. But this is, we don't have, we don't know uh, uh, the, stand, uh, the population standard deviation. So we had to calculate T instead. So now T is a bit less forgiving, right? We need more extreme value T. So we don't have a we, we don't have individual tables for every different size of sample for T like we have for Z. So we're going to have to go to our table, which gives us the important values of T. Okay, let me open that. Whoops, did I get a Z table again? Okay, here we go. So this table gives us the important values of T. So let's take a look at them. So if we're willing to have, if we want a 95% level of confidence, in other words, 5% chance of being wrong, right, then we need a right-tailed area of 2.5% and a left-tailed area of 2.5%. So the value of T that we're interested in is going to be in this column right here. Okay, so let's see. If I go, what was our sample size again? It was 100, right? So our degrees of freedom is 99. They don't have that large a value here. But we can stick with 100. It's pretty close. So our critical value of T is 1.98. Z, as long as we exceeded 1.96 for Z, if we, knew the Z, if we were going to do the Z score, we could reject the null hypothesis if, our, if our, the score we count, our test statistic, came out to be bigger than 1.96, further out than 1.96. Well, in this case, our uh, since we're working with a sample size 100, 
we need our T-score to be bigger than 1.98. That's our critical value of T for this sample size. So for this sample size, can I reject the null hypothesis? Yes, because our test statistic exceeds this number, which is the equivalent number that you would need to be at least uh, have less than 5% chance of getting that extreme of value. Well, how about if the sample size was, how about if the sample size was nine? Uh, sample size was 10, nine degrees of freedom. Do I still exceed it? Yeah, I do, right? Still, right? 2.5. Well, how about if the sample size were six, five degrees of freedom? Well, no, now I don't exceed it. Now I would have had to have this extreme of value for the test of piece, test statistic T in order to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, see the difference here between using the z-score. Z-score we could actually look up the areas. Yes. So when you are using the z-score, like you were saying, you get the t I doubled whatever that tail was that I was looking yeah. at, the left and the right tail. Because the z-score that you found out that you have looked up the area in the tail. And doubled it for a two-sided, what they call a two-sided test. But I won't confuse you right now. I'll confuse you next week with with a one-sided test, right? So we won't confuse you right now with a two-sided, you know, with a one-sided test. Okay, let's try another one. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, I think we did this already. Uh, this is the same thing except it's a it, it's a small sample size. Okay, a little league baseball coach wants to know if his team is represented above the team scoring runs. Nationally, the average number of runs scored in a Little League team is 5.7. That's a population mean, right? In other words, mu, mu national is equal to 5.7. Okay? He chooses nine games at random in which his team scored 5, 9, 4, 11, 10, 8, 7, 12, and 8 runs. That's nine games, right? Yes, it is. Okay. Is it likely that his team scores could have come from the national distribution? Assume an alpha level of 0.05. Okay. So what do we know about his team? Well, we know that, for instance, let's see. We don't know sigma, do we? Nobody mentioned anything about standard deviation. Okay. Equals unknown. Okay, so that's the, that's the national average, the population. So what about our sample? X bar, right? Well, we can calculate that, right? We've got nine numbers. We can figure out what X bar is, right? Okay, what about the standard deviation? Well, since we don't know sigma, we have to get the standard deviation from our sample. And that's going to be equal to, we can calculate that. And what about our sample size? Our sample size is equal to uh, 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 nine. Okay, and what else do we need to know? We have to decide before we do this, what is our acceptable level of error? So alpha is going to be equal to, again, 0 0.05. Okay, we can call it 5%. Okay, so let's calculate X bar, the standard deviation, the, uh, uh, and then use that. Then, then we'll put together our uh, null and alternative hypothesis. Okay, so as it happens, I think I uploaded a copy of this the blackboard into Excel. Okay. Takes a while for it to wake up. I mean in the meantime, let me see what's going on online. Oh, okay. They're working on it. Good. What's that? Okay, let me, I want to get my spreadsheet up here, piece of wall. Here we go. Okay, me, standard deviation. I'll put standard error over there. Equals average parentheses. Okay, and standard deviation. Oops. Equal to standard standard deviation is equal to now my standard error is going to be equal to my standard deviation. 
divided by the square root of my sample size, which is 9. 0.087. 0 0.088. Okay. You guys get the same kind of numbers as I got? Okay. So, what did I do here? This over, this over. It's both at the same time. So my mean is my mean is eight point two two. My standard deviation is two point six three six four. And my sample size is nine. And I just calculated my standard error while I was at it, and it was zero point. Eight seven. Okay. Well, before we go any further, let's let's formulate our null and alternative hypothesis. Okay. So did you guys formulate your own null and alternative hypothesis? Okay, so the way I would phrase this, I would say that uh, mu for uh, mu for the uh, national national for the uh, uh, population, right? All of the teams was equal is equal to mu for the uh, local team, right? Okay, and my alternative hypothesis is going to be mu. Oops, mu for the population is not equal to, not equal to mu for our local team. Okay, so we're going to test that, not only an alternative hypothesis. Okay, okay again, another way I could have phrased this was that mu local is equal to, since it's a set value that I'm comparing it to, 5.7. Or mu local is not equal to 5.7. Okay, because we already, we already mentioned here that mu, the national team, is equal to 5.7. For, for all the players on national, it's 5.7. Okay, so now we have to calculate our statistic. Are we going to calculate a Z statistic or a T statistic? T, right, because we don't know what sigma is. Okay, and it's a small sample. Okay, so T is going to be equal to going to be equal to X bar minus mu for the population divided by the standard error. So T is going to be equal to Two point eight nine. Two is it that is it that much? Really? Let me get Excel out. Check it myself. Okay. Not now. Okay. Okay. So T going to be equal to the difference between our mean, x bar, minus 5.7, right? Oops. Minus 5.7, parentheses, divided by the standard error. 2.87. Good. Okay, you guys got 2.87. Okay, now is that T score big enough for me to reject the null hypothesis? 
the T-score has to be big enough that the p-value associated with it is less than 0.05. So I got to go to my t-table. And since we're, we're, we're interested in a 5% uh, uh, chance of being wrong, 95% confidence, I'm going to go down here and find the critical value of t for a sample size of 9, which is 8 degrees of freedom. So the critical value of t is 2.306. So if I have a T-score 2.306 or larger, that means that my probability, the P-value, the area that that represents, uh, has to be some of the two areas that that represents, is going to be smaller than 5%, okay? Which means my P is less than 5%, which means it's less than my alpha, which means that I can reject my null hypothesis. Okay? But let's try another one. Okay, this time we're going to do we're going to work with a proportion. Okay, first of all, what do you know about proportions? General in general, what proportions? What kind of sample size are we working with? Large sample size, right? We want each group to have at least fifteen people in it, right? The, the either side of the popu of the group, so it's going to be always going to be sample size of thirty or bigger. Often, most often, it's going to be quite a bit bigger than that. Let's see let's see what we have here. The proportion of attending uh, uh, people attending Hunter. That report having a close friend who is a diligent student is 30%, 0.30. In other words, sample 100 people, 30 of them say that they, their, their closest friend is a diligent student. Uh, that, 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 this is, I didn't really go to SUNY New Paltz, but I knew SUNY New Paltz when in the 60s, SUNY New Paltz had a, a reputation of being a party school. I have no idea if that's true now. Anybody know? Is it still a party school? At any rate, had a reputation of major party school. Not sure that, 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 that okay. An investigator randomly samples students at, at New Paul's and finds that 20 out of 100 uh, people report having a friend who is a diligent student. So it's a different percentage than at Hunter. At Hunter, we know that uh, that uh, all that this represents the population. This represents the population at Hunter. 30 percent are diligent students. At New Paul's, a sample of 100 suggests that. Uh, 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 that the proportion is 20%, right? Sample size is 100. Okay, so let's say let's say that uh, let's let's first before we do anything, let's phrase our null and alternative hypothesis. Uh, uh, our I'm going to start out with our, our proportion. I'm going to notice I'm not using p cap here. P cap represents the sample proportion. Right, so in our null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, we're always describing what we're predicting about the population, not any samples. Right, so the proportion of a hunter students is e of a hunter students who are diligent students is equal to the proportion of uh, uh, SUNY students who are diligent students. And my alternative hypothesis is the proportion of hunter students that are diligent students is not equal to the proportion for SUNY students, SUNY New Plus students, right? So it's always P, right? P, P represents the population proportion for each of those schools. Now, for, for Hunter, I know that the population proportion happens to be 0 0.30, right? We were given that information for the population. For, for SUNY, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have put that there. For Hunter, let me let me put it across here. For Hunter, the population proportion is equal to zero point three zero. For for the SUNY student, for the SUNY, we don't know what the population proportion is, right? We only know what p cap is, and p cap is equal to twenty out of a hundred. Or in other words, equal to 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0. Okay, so let's test our hypothesis here, our, our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. Okay, actually, I want to put them up here instead of in here. Okay, so I'm going to actually, I'm going to change this a little bit. Just go ahead and calculate the entire, calculate what the T statistic would be for this. Okay, for this comparison. Okay, it's going to work out exactly. I'm going to give you a formula to work with. 
Okay, here's our formula. Okay, T is going to be equal to, is going to be equal to uh, P cap, right, minus P, just like, just as we did with a numeric variable, X bar minus uh, uh, mu, right, P cap minus P, over the standard error. And the standard error is going to be calculated a little bit differently. Right, guys, remember what the formula for standard error for proportion is? Standard error is equal to, it's going to be equal to, what's it going to be equal to? It's going to be P, it's going to be equal to P times 1 minus P, right? P over the sample size. I'm going to find the square root of the whole thing. Okay, so which proportion should I use here? in this P. Which proportion would you use there? Would you use the 30% or would you use the 20%? Well, which one do you know better? You know the, the SUNY one better. Let's use the SUNY one. I'm sorry, we know the Hunter one, right? Because that's the population proportion for Hunter. If we knew it, it see, if we didn't, if we didn't call hunt the hunter proportion the a population proportion, we didn't say that we knew what the proportion was for all hunter students. We'd have a little bit of a quandary here, wouldn't we? We'd have two proportions. We wouldn't know which one to use to calculate the standard error, right? Same thing happens with if we take two samples instead of one sample. Each one of those two samples is going to have its own standard deviation. So, gee, which of those standard deviations do I use to calculate the standard error? And I try and calculate my statistic. Ah, things are going to get a little bit more complicated when we start talking about situations where we take two samples from a population. It's going to be necessary to deal with that complication because most of the time we deal, we don't know what either population mean really is or proportion is. We're, we're dealing strictly with samples when we're doing a comparison. But we can hold that off until next week. Okay, so give this give this a shot. Okay, calculate what the t value is. I can't e I can't easily turn off my screen here and do it on my own. Let's see. Two, 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 two. one. There's my calculator. Okay, oh my gosh, here. Yeah. The proportion, the, the proportion, for, well, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because, what do you think? Proportion for, for, uh, for the, I think I would use the one from the, uh, the one that's known. Well, yeah, that I'm just, I was asking, like, if Times point seven. Uh, that was known. It was for a population proportion. Uh, divided by sample size was what a hundred equals that and square root four six. Four six. Okay, again, oh, I made a little bit of a misstep there, right? It's a large sample. So what am I going to use? Am I going to use Z or am I going to use T? I'm going to use Z. Anybody come up with the calculation for Z yet? 
That's what I got. Let's see if anybody else comes up with a different answer. Okay, so how do I get that 2.18? Well, let's see. Standard error is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to 0 0.3 times 0.7 over 100. And we're going to take the square root of that whole thing. Okay, I'm going to do that in Excel. Demonstrate that in Excel. Okay, so standard error is equal to 0.3 square root of 0.3 times 0.7 divided by 100. Okay, draw multiplication so I don't have to break it up any more than that. It comes out to 0.04, about 0.046. And what is my z score going to be equal to? My z-score is going to be equal to the difference between the two proportions, the sample proportion and the population proportion, p cap minus p, okay, which is, is, is 0.2 minus 0.3, so it's minus, minus 0.1 divided by the standard error. So how many standard errors, how many uh, standard errors, how, what's our z-score? Our z-score is minus 2.18. So if I go to my z-table, What's the likelihood of getting that extreme of value? Well, let's see. Negative 2.18, negative 2.2.1012345. Six, seven, eight is about one and a half percent. But that's only on one tail. I have to double that because it's a two-tail test, right? Okay, so one and a half percent doubled is about three percent. So our p-value, our probability of being wrong if we reject the null hypothesis, is three percent. So what's our conclusion? It's less than five percent, right? Chance of being wrong. So we fail to reject. Okay, the null hypothesis. I'm sorry, excuse me, what am I saying? You're going to let me get away with that, right? I reject the null hypothesis. Well, if I reject the null hypothesis, what can I conclude then once I've rejected the null hypothesis? That the alternative hypothesis is true. So I accept, I accept the alternative Okay, so if you reject the null hypothesis, you can then accept the alternative. You reject the idea that they're equal, so you can accept that the proportions are different than your alternative hypothesis. What if you fail to reject the height? The, uh, what, what if your conclusion is, let's say we got a z-score of one, one and a half. So our p-value was way too high for us to reject the null hypothesis, way more than 5%. Uh, what do I say about the null hypothesis? We say we failed, we failed to reject it. What then do we say about the alternative hypothesis in that case? Okay. I can't say anything, right? I failed to reject that they're different, so I have no conclusion about the alternative hypothesis. I just simply say I failed to reject the null hypothesis. If you reject the null hypothesis, then you can accept the alternative. Okay, I'm going to do quickly do one, one other interesting thing here, which is something that's going to come up as we move into the future. You guys remember that program called SPSS and R? Okay, well, we can use those to help us out here. Let me uh, clear this. Whoops. Clear all. I'm going to take this, these values that I have for the baseball team, and I'm going to, I'm going to save them. To the desktop. Uh, desktop. 
I'm going to save them. Then I'm going to open up SPSS. Okay, I'm going to say open. Data. I can import an Excel file uh, from uh, uh, using SPSS. I just have to let it know that I'm looking for an Excel file, that file type. And it will appear on the desktop. And baseball. Baseball. Here it is. Baseball. we will import these values. Uh-oh. What did it not like? No. I don't want to do that. Try this again. Open data. Excel. Baseball. Oh, here it is. Well, you know what that is? That's a shortcut, I guess, that it saw there. I'm going to say, OK, it's going to import them. OK, and here's my nine values. Uh, now you guys have to remember how to do uh, descriptive statistics. I can go up here to analyze descriptive statistics and descriptives, and I can ask it to tell me the average values, the standard deviation, and so on and so forth for uh, those values. Mean standard deviation. Great, that's good enough. Okay, here's our output. What does it look like? Okay, let's see. The mean is 8.22, same thing that we calculated before. The standard deviation for these nine values is 2.65, right? Okay, so now we took those values, we calculated the standard error based on the sample size, the standard deviation divided by the square root of nine, divided by th uh, three. That was our standard error. We found the difference between the 8.22 and the 5.7, the population value, divided it by the standard error, it gave us a gave us a t-score. We then went to our uh, reference table for critical values of t. We were able to look at that critical value of t and say, we exceeded the critical value of t, so the p-value must be less than 0.05, which means I can reject the null hypothesis. Did we know what the p-value was exactly? No, because we only saw the critical value of p. We only knew it was less than 0.05, which means it's OK to reject the null hypothesis, but we don't know actually what it was. But now, if I go to, if I use SPSS, and I go to Analyze, now notice we have some other choices here we haven't gotten to. Compare means. And notice that, among other things, we have one sample t-test, where we know the population mean, we're comparing our sample to it. Uh, independent samples t-test, where we have two independent samples. Uh, paired samples t-test, and some other choices as well. For now, we're using one sample t-test. Okay, and we're going to say that we want to work with this baseball variable, baseball score variable, and we want to compare it to a known value for a population. And that's where I'm going to put that test value in, which is 5.7. Okay, when I say OK, it will perform our t test for us. Anybody remember what we got for the t value? How about 2.871? Okay. And what was our uh, degrees of freedom? Was 8. And the Significance, two-tailed significance, that's the p-value. That's the way SPSS indicates the p-value. And notice it says two-tailed. It's already taken the one tail and doubled it, is 0 0.021. So 0 0.021 indicates that there's only a 2.1% chance, uh, 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 only uh, well under a 5% chance. We would be wrong if we reject the null hypothesis. So this has done that, that test for us. OK, so a little bit easier than doing the calculation, right? So it's not a terrible thing. You want to do one more? Should we do one more or call it a night? Try one more. I see P half of you are packing up. Looks like you're tired. Let me see. Let me see what's here. What else I got here? OK, let's see what the next one looks like. See if it's interesting, at least. OK. Oh, OK. OK, here's another, uh, 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 here's another simple single sample t-test 
uh, unknown sigma, right? Sample size is nine, sigma is unknown. Uh, and we're testing against a known mean of eight, right? So null hypothesis, mu one is equal to uh, uh, mu for our pop test population, our sample population is equal to eight or mu is not equal to eight. Let's see if we got something better. Here's a two sam sample hypothesis test. I'll tell you what, let's take this just for the hell of it. Whoops. That happened to just for the hell of it just to close out the night let's copy this let's go back to SPSS and I'm going to go into SPSS and I'll make a new data file and I'm going to paste this in here okay except I got to copy these out of here There we go. What am I doing here? I'm coding this so that the first nine are males and the second nine are females. Okay. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to tell it that this variable is um, a measure and this variable is gender. And for gender, one's gonna be male and two is gonna be female. So that we can tell the difference between the two. Okay, just as a preview of what we're going to be looking at next week, let's look at the difference between these two. Let's analyze it. Go into Descriptive Statistics Explorer. And let's see. The measure, I'm going to put that into my dependence, and then I'm going to factor by gender, split up the males and the females. Okay, and then I'm going to find my descriptive statistics, and I'm going to say, okay. Let's see what we have. Well, the average for the males is 10. The average for the females is 7.55 but we calculated a standard deviation and we calculate confidence intervals and so on and so forth well let's actually do a t-test to compare the two means the mean of pot mean for males equals equals the mean for females is our null hypothesis it's two samples now and our alternative hypothesis is, is that the mean for females does not equal the mean for males right so let's go ahead and actually do that analyze I'm going to go into compare means. Well, this is not a one sample t test. Now, this is a two sample t test or an independent sample t test. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, okay, measure is going to be the values of the numerical variable. Gender is going to be, whoops, gender is going to be my grouping variable. I got to define the groups. I got to tell it that that's one and two of the numbers I represent it. I'm going to go into options here and 95%, in other words, alpha is equal to 0.05. I'm happy with that. I'll click OK, and SPSS will do a will do some descriptive statistics. You'll put a couple of couple of box plots, uh, create a couple of box plots, and then do a t test for us. So now we have a little bit of a problem here, and that is is that we had two different standard deviations for these two groups. So which standard deviation should we use, males or females? Can we combine the two and use the and assume that they're equal? And just combine the two, maybe get a better reading on the standard deviation. Should we assume that they're not equal and, and calculate it that way? Well, as what SPSS actually does is it actually calculates the t-score twice. The first time it calculates it, it assumes equal variances, equal variance in the two groups. It combines them to get a single variance that it can use to calculate the standard error. Or it doesn't assume that they're equal and calculates it that way. So let's take a look at this. If it, if it calculates it, as it happens in this particular example, the t-score is very similar. The degrees of freedom are different, t-score is very similar, but in both cases, what's my p-value in both cases? Is it less than 5%? So either way that I do it, or either way that I 
uh, do it with SPSS. In both cases, I rejected all, just barely rejected all hypotheses, right? There's just a little under 5% rejected all hypotheses and accept the alternative. Okay, 